everyone. Uh, just wanted to jump in real quick before we get started and say a quick thank you to all my patrons on Patreon. Uh, thank you for supporting this class. And um, I look forward to creating new videos and new content with your support. So thank you very much. Um, your name should be appearing in this general area right now. Thanks. I'm recording. OK, um, so last week we had uh, you had an unexpected day off. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, there's just, I'm always trying to do too many things at the same time and there's just too much going on and I, I got stressed out and couldn't sleep. And then I was not very functional on Saturday. I still did my live stream of the video game later in the afternoon, but uh, yeah, it uh, <laughs> didn't go very well. Uh, my, my brain was just not working. Uh, so when I woke up that morning, I thought, um, you know, I can't really keep my thoughts straight all that well. I won't be able to explain things very well. So it's probably better if uh, we just skip it for today. Um, better to, to have an unexpected day off than to have a, a class where I am not actually able to explain anything. Um, okay, so that's all of that. Um, I think I'm gonna plan in some, some bye weeks just as a rule. Because uh, I've noticed if you look at the schedule, it's like every three weeks or so I, I take a day off and it's like, hmm, that's probably about the rate at which I kind of need a break from uh, teaching on Saturday mornings. Um, so yeah, in the future, I'll just plan for that. The next day off is March 27th because we're moving, uh, which isn't much of a break, uh, but I'll probably plan one for the month after that too and just kind of work that into the schedule. Okay, um, so I need to break down the names. I knew I was forgetting something. And the thing I was forgetting was to have the notebook for writing down the names of the participants. Let's find something. Uh, okay, there we go. Okay, so I see Christian Aurelio Rasmus. Oh, I don't actually see all these people. Hang on one second. Let's start over. Okay, so um, Aurelio, Moaz, uh, Christian, Dante, David, Rasmus, and Nathan, um, if I didn't say your name, just let me know real quick. Uh, I didn't mean to exclude anyone. I tried to get the full list. So that's um, of the people who want to answer questions. That's one, two, three, four, five, six people. Um, let me see how many questions we have. Let's try to get the math right this time on this. So it's, it's like 42 plus 19, so 61, I think. Uh, not that great at arithmetic. Um, that seems right. Okay, so everyone gets like roughly 10, sorry, six people reading, so 10 questions each. Uh, so let's just do them in groups of five. Uh, I'll start, I'll just run down my list here in the order that I have you. Uh, Aurelio, do you wanna do the first five? Sure, let's start off. So, Papot and Tai Chintif Imau, the cup and Tai Chintif, that comes from Chine, so to find a uh, to find so the cup that i found there yeah uh you said chintef comes from china to find what's this t what's that um, doing in there well that's because it's a pronominal form um and it's an old infinitive i guess yeah that's t. right it is the it is the t from the infinitive so we we're talking about this yesterday in in the reading class um a lot of times the pre-pronominal form you get this um like intrusive T in there, and it is often because a certain class of verbs in older stages of Egyptian uh, ended in a, a weak consonant. So this verb was uh, gemi, like G-M-Y or G-M-Yod in earlier stages of Egyptian. And uh, those 
the infinitive is formed by adding a T. So the infinitive of, of gimme would be uh, gamet. And that mm. gets preserved in the pre-pronominal form. And that threw me off for a moment. It's really chi ne with an N in, in Coptic, not with an M, right? So something yep. changed there? Okay. Something oh. changed there. I'm not sure what exactly. So I, I don't think anybody fully understands what happened with M's and N's uh, going from older stages of Egyptian into Coptic. There's definitely something weird going on and it's probably a fairly complicated process with lots of different ins and outs uh, because it's, it just looks really messy. Like uh, in, you get random looking cases like this one where it's like, why would they change the, the consonant in this verb? Like why wouldn't they just, why wouldn't it just stay the same? Um, and then you get uh, really consistent ones like the N preposition. Sorry, I'm messing with my T here. It's got a, it's got a strainer in it. I can't get the lid on it. Uh, okay, let's just put that aside. Um, so then you have cases like the preposition N, which becomes M before uh, labial consonants. Right. That's normal though. Yeah, and that one's that one's really predictable. Uh, I just see. I feel like let me let me make sure I didn't miss anybody. Uh, I I see a new uh, a new face, Peter. Uh, Peter, just let me know either uh, by speaking up or in the chat real quick whether you want to participate in uh, the exercises. Uh, I would love to try and sound them out. I'm only on chapter one, but yeah, oh, that'd be amazing. Fine. Yeah, <laughs> sounding them out is is always allowed, even encouraged, um, because I find that it kind of forces us to slow down and pay attention to things in a way that is really useful. Uh, even if you've kind of advanced in the study of a language, it's always a good idea to kind of uh, take things slow every once in a while and make sure you really understand every part because it's all too easy uh, to get locked into things and sort of forget that you're missing some part of it. Um, so yeah, I'll definitely, I'll, I'll put you on the list to read. Um, Aurelio, do you want to continue with these five? Sure thing. So next one, Pnomos enter choice ta Moses. So the law that the Lord gave to Moses. And yeah, gave what? Is, that he gave to Moses, uh, Moses, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The law that he gave to Moses. That's right. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I was trying to get you to say gave it, but then that doesn't, that's not actually the way you would say it in English because we don't right, repeat the right, pronoun. Right. True. But so, yeah, pronominal form of T, uh, Taaf. Good. Next one, Hovnim in Tau Aau. So everything that the um, disciples did, and that's from Ire. So Ire becomes uh, Aa or Aau. And in this case, yeah, everything that plural it, so to say, they did. Yeah. It. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that this is the, the pronoun is plural. So this is the object of uh, Iri to do. And I, I'll tell you, this, um, this verb is actually quite regular. People are always surprised by that when I say it uh, the first time. But uh, if you if you work it out, if you work through the sound changes um, that are regular to Coptic, you'll find that you actually should expect this outcome. Uh, so it's it comes from uh, iret, like the infinitive of iri to do. Uh, and then, yeah, if you if you if you kind of do the math on known sound changes between earlier Egyptian and Coptic, you should end up with this result. Uh, so this has a glottal stop in it. Obviously, that's why we have a-a. Uh -uh. And uh, that comes from the uh, syllable final R before a T. So it, it would have been something like art. And then the T is lost and the syllable final R becomes a glottal stop. So a. Uh. And you can actually see a comparison to this in if you're listening to, uh, to music in English, the word heart kind of goes through the same derivation in English. If you, for some reason, uh, even American uh, speakers of American English, when they sing, will use kind of a non-rhotic pronunciation. Like, a, I think it comes from like the Delta Blues tradition or from the British invasion or a combination thereof. Uh, but people will say, instead of heart, they'll say, ah, it's just like a vowel plus a glottal stop. And that's the whole word. And if it sounds kind of crazy that the word would just be the letter A kind of by itself. But then if you look at the English word heart and like break it apart phonetically, it makes perfect sense, right? Because it's like this, 
and you get an unreleased T. So the T is just heart. It just doesn't get released even in normal American English. Uh, the, the sort of like imitation uh, Delta blues or British pronunciation gets rid of the H and then the non-roticity gets rid of the final R and replaces it with a glottal stop. And there you go. Your, your five letter word becomes a single syllable, uh, barely intelligible sound. And a very similar thing happened with Yiddy. You get that basically that exact same process. Um, so it is entirely regular, although it looks totally crazy because the, the verb has all these weird forms. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about, what's going on here, Aurelio? Um, well, when you have hovnim, so anything, everything, you can see that as a, as a singular or as a, as a plural. And sure. I think uh, we switch there sometimes in English and definitely in Coptic. Oh, in yeah. this case, we decided to see it as a plural. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Very good explanation. All right. Cool. Oh. Number four, Shere Entas Mastiff, uh, the son which she bore. And that comes yes. from Mise. So Mise becomes Mastiff in the three phenomenal. Exactly. Again, yeah. So Mise is also one of these, uh, it's called Tertiae and Firme in like ah. uh, over the top okay. uh, ancient grammar. But yes, yeah, the so verbs a, of the third week class. Third week Got verb, it. yeah. Mm. Makes sense. So it's really. MSI, so to say, in an old Egyptian. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah. And then the infinitive, uh, that, that I gets replaced with a T. And that's just part of the formation of the infinitive in earlier Egyptian. Uh, Got it. So, yeah, cool. that's what mm -hmm. happens. Okay. Pe pneuma in akarton. No, akatarton. In akatarton, entaf nojib evol. So the unclean spirit that he cast for uh, cast out. Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, so next on my list, I see Moaz. Moaz, do you want five of these? Okay. Carpos and Tasintif the fruit that she brought to her husband. Yeah. What's going on with this? Intef. What verb is that? It's. Uh, it's uh, the, the one that means uh, bring, uh, Ina. Yeah, that's it, Ina. Um, not too many keyboards going on here to keep track. But yeah, so this is, a, this is also regular. I think it's like this. Um, I think this, these are the, the principal parts. Um, and you can see that like, okay, so when we make it uh, a prefix, like in the pre-nominal or a, um, uh, a base for the suffix pronoun to rest on, as in the pre-pronominal, you get this natural kind of like reduction in, um, I don't know, in, in the uh, in the strength of the vowel. I don't know the right word for this in linguistic terms, but um, the vowel gets weaker, it gets smaller, and it gets turned into something like a schwa um, or just a syllab syllabic consonant, however you want to interpret that. And then this T also is because this word is actually inet. Um, and this is a really old one. This is like one of the, um, this verb consistently has a T in it all the time. And it's kind of where that process gets started where you, where you get these, um, these T's in the infinitives. Uh, I think that's one of the earliest examples we have where it very consistently has that T in it. Um, and then, of course, in the absolute form in ina, there is a final T there. It's just unreleased. Uh, so it's not marked in writing. But it's kind of like the, the T's at the end of a word in French. It, it will come back in when you stick something else onto the word, uh, or if it's me immediately followed by a vowel or something. Uh, so that's where you get ent. The T gets preserved there when it's followed by something. So yeah. OK. Um, probably the last time I'll go over that, but I just want to, maybe I'll mention it again a few more times, but it's just worth remembering how all these things com come about because they're not arbitrary, but they are uh, pretty uh, pretty idiosyncratic. It's a good idea to look at them. Uh, do you want to continue with seven? Uh, yes. Jaja in the Matoi Shintif, the enemy that the soldiers sought. Yeah, good. OK, next okay. one. Uh, Part at the Empe Ematoi Chintif, the money that the soldiers did not find. Good, yeah. Um, 
Pintas Mastiff e Peshai, uh, the one that she bore to her husband. Yeah, and what do you think this thing is? Uh, her, her son or her yeah. daughter or their children. Uh, can't be daughter. And why can't it be daughter? Oh, because uh, the definite article is uh, pe. Right, that's right. So having this masculine definite article here, the one whom she bore him uh, for her husband. Also, this F would give it away. It would be tentas mastes if it were a woman uh, or a daughter. Um, right. It could also be, obviously, it doesn't make much sense with the verb being to bear. Um, but you can imagine, I don't know, there's that scene in Game of Thrones where the red woman gives birth to the like shadow monster or something. Like, uh, it doesn't actually have to be a human here. Uh, and this is something that I, I mentioned deliberately. So one of the things I've noticed with American students is they will very often have trouble with uh, the idea that this pe or te can sometimes refer to a person and can sometimes refer to a thing, uh, but all nouns in Coptic have gender, right? So we don't actually know from the fact that this is pentas mastef. We don't know that it's necessarily a, a, a son yet. We're just deciding based on the verb, like to give birth. Presumably humans give birth to other humans, not really to shadow monsters very often. So, uh, so yeah, that's how that works. Just in case there is any confusion. Okay, Nentau and To Sharon, the ones that brought them to us. Yeah, good. Um, that's a pretty dense sentence. Uh, you got it right. So the verb is just this little part here. So the plural ones whom they brought them and then Sharon up to us. So uh, just a more polite way of saying like toward us. Okay, uh, very good, Moaz. Uh, I'll Wait, is it? Oh, sorry. I got my names out of order. Uh, Christian, do you want to do five of these? Sure. Um, number 11 is Pentatitan uh, Aav. Um, that which y'all did. Yeah. Um, uh, 12 is Nintan Chintu Mao. Those which we found there. Yeah. Uh, good. Those which we found there. Yeah. I'm going to do both of these. Uh, the one whom we, uh, I'm sorry, the one whom y'all did it. And then uh, the one whom we found, the ones whom we found them there. Uh, I kind of like including that resumptive pronoun in translations. I don't know why. It's just yeah. like very, very intellectually satisfying. In some might, might help like, put little hyphens in between each of the elements, maybe. Yeah. For the, for the new joiners. Um, Number one, um, B1, Sultan Etasvo, uh, listen to my teaching. Yeah, that's how I should start every class. <laughs> Sultan Etasvo. Um, number two, Se uh, Terote Pache, <laughs> drink the milk, my child. It's <laughs> <laughs> definitely not how I'm going to start every class. That's how it was said in weirdly, the it's me otherwise. Weirdly creepy phrase. <laughs> Um, and then number three, na nai pa joys, which means have mercy on me, my lord. Yeah, good. Um, okay, I don't see anything to, to change there, so I think, I think we're all good. Uh, these can be a little baffling, these little like monosyllabic words, uh, but that's just where vocabulary really comes in. Um, you just get used to seeing those things. Maybe reading is also a good practice there. Dante, do you want to do five? Sure. Uh, em perchoos en laau en rome. So um, don't tell it to anyone. Yeah. Could that be it? That's or it. Or does it just mean don't, don't speak to anyone? Is the sigma that dummy object or is it um, an actual object? Like don't say this particular thing rather than just don't speak in general. Um, well, there's really no distinction, so, no, uh, it's, so it's both. it could be either. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and that's just the thing. Joe really wants to take a direct object, so if you see it with a direct object, you can't be sure that it really needs to be uh, say it in mm -hmm. English translation. It could just be like, don't speak. So yeah, don't, don't speak, don't talk to them. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, hare e nientole teru. So keep all these commandments or obey all these commandments, something like that. Yeah, what are you doing with hare? Well, that just means to to keep them or guard them or preserve right. them or something, right? Yeah, it's an imperative. Then, it is an imperative, yeah. yeah. And it's and it means something like keep or guard. And then we have this construction yeah. where with hare e ne intole, right. which is like idiomatic. It, it doesn't really literally translate. It doesn't make sense. Like guard to these commandments, uh, but you you uh, you handled it correctly. Oh shoot, I got out of line. Which where did you you started here? Okay, so you're going to yeah. Eight, so I'm so up just... to six. Okay, yeah. got it. Okay, so shem uh, sheem pechoes peknute. So um, obey the Lord your God. Good. Again, yeah. an imperative. An imperative, and shem uh, she originally meant to follow. Uh, that's shemsi, uh, I think. Shemsi mm -hmm. in Middle Egyptian. Middle Egyptian. It's hard to say because there's this, uh, this is a good example actually of this phenomenon uh, called uh, palatal, har wait, sibilant harmony? Sibilant harmony, I think, or palatal harmony. I can't remember the term now, uh, but basically it was uh, shemsi, and then in Coptic it's always shemshe. So the, uh, the second S sound has been harmonized with, the, with this palatal S sound, uh, and we see that in a lot of other places. That's the that's a phenomenon I use to argue that this janja is probably pronounced like a j ja sound, uh, because we see it in a lot of words that have janja in them. So, for instance, the word uh, saji in Ohiric Coptic is shaje, word or or speak in Saitic Coptic. So we have an example of sibilant harmony there that kind of tells us, okay, this must have been pronounced um, as like an affricate. Uh, not as a, just a palatal, because otherwise you can't get the harmony. So yeah, there you go. Okay. Sorry about that. That's a, uh, a lot of explanation for a small thing. Empercho <laughs> eroi, don't wait for me. Good, yeah, that's exactly it. And ea uh, peko, wash your face. Wash your face, that's exactly how I would translate it. Um, Wash your face. Okay, uh, good job, Dante. David, do you want to take five? Yeah, okay. Um, and per walk et uh, teremos. Do not uh, go to the desert. Good, yeah. Hare et tapsuke pajois. Preserve uh, my soul, my lord. Yeah. Um, yeah, preserve my soul. Uh, suke is, is this weird word where uh, it doesn't really translate into English. Uh, it's it, and like in different Coptic texts, it will mean like a dozen different things, but it can be um, it can mean save my life, my lord, or it can mean um, guard my mind against forces of evil or something, uh, my lord. Uh, so this can actually mean like a dozen different things, but your translation is totally fine. Okay, uh, number 11, ma and ka nim en nevien. Mm, so I'm not so sure about this one. Nim is the every is an every something, and then nevien uh, was an adjective meaning the poor ones or the wretched ones. Yeah, um, exactly. So in ka, I'll tell you, means like thing. Um, normally, it means physical thing rather than like abstract uh, concept or, or matter. Uh, so in ka, nim is everything. Kanim is everything. Ma, I guess, then is a, I guess an imperative form of. Uh, don't you, I don't know what verb it is. There's a verb, mu or. No. No, it's um, it's it's irregular. It's the imperative of d to give. Okay. And it's just one of these weird things. It's a case of suppletion, also, where uh, it presumably comes from a totally different verb. Um, <laughs> But it by the time of old Egyptian, it's already taken over as the imperative okay. for D. So yeah. So give everything to uh, the poor. Yeah. Uh, so this is probably we can imagine Jesus speaking here. This is the first thing he commands people to do. Mm. Uh, so cho nemai hen 
that was uh, the show we had earlier, um, which I already forgot. Uh, it can mean uh, wait or stay. Okay, so stay with me, uh, I guess, in Teuche today. Uh, no, close. In, um, in uh, stay with me, uh, sort of, Teuche. Isn't it during the day or? No. Uche? The other one. It reminds me of that Willie Nelson song. I think it's on Redheaded Stranger where it's like, Can I sleep in your arms tonight, lady? Oh, it's yes, such it's a good night. song. Night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So stay so, with me tonight. Stay with me tonight. Yeah. It's a, it's it's much more um I don't know, like uh uh risque than you were going for with your translation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what well, what is day then just for uh, I so that I uh, how Hau is the word for day. Oh, okay. And there's, um, so Hau is the word that means like the time of day, like literally the 12 hours between uh, sunrise and sunset. Because remember at this time, um, mechanical clocks hadn't been invented. They wouldn't be invented for another thousand years uh, in, in Northern Europe, I believe, is where they were first invented. So until that time, like until the uh, roughly, someone who knows better than me, please speak up. Uh, roughly, the like Renaissance period where uh, people created mechanical clocks. Hours varied in length, and they 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 reckoned everything by like sunrise to sunset. There were twelve hours between sunrise and sunset, and twelve hours at night. And the length of those hours would vary depending on the time of the year. So in the summer, obviously, those hours would be quite long because you're dividing up a long day. Um, although it doesn't vary quite as much in Egypt as as many of us are used to because we live at higher latitudes um but still they would and so ho is specifically the 12 hours of daytime uh Uche, and there's um a gore, there's a few words um for the 12 hours between um sunset and sunrise and then there's also a word uh su that you'll see normally in date entries that refers to the actual 24 hour thing that we now call a day so the cycle of dark and light is a is a specific word that you don't see very often. Um, so yeah, a little bit on Egyptian timekeeping, which is a really interesting topic. They invented the twenty four hour uh, clock, but they didn't um, make it quite as precise as we did. Okay, uh, thirteen. Aniso and Matoy and Mak. I think ni is a, some is some is it some irregular imperative of a kind. It is, uh, yeah. Uh, it's not ani, that ani. irregular. Um, it's it looks a lot like the verb it comes from. Ina. Yeah. Okay. So bring uh, something. <laughs> I'll tell you that that's a number. Ah. Okay. Oh. Yeah. So I want to say that it is two. That would be snow. Snow. So. I think three is something like shomte or. Shomt, yeah. Shomt, to, diu, so. So, so three, four, five, six. Six, yeah. Um, bring sort of sort of bring six uh, soldiers uh, to me to you. No. Nemak. Right. To you would be nak. This is nemak. It's from mm -hmm. uh, men. It's the it's the nemma is the pre pronominal form of the word that With is you. men. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Bring six soldiers with you. I just realized how like uh, sci fi the the word nemok sounds when you say it like over and over. It definitely sounds like something from Star Trek. Um. Anyway, okay. Thank you, David. Uh, Rasmus, do you want to do five? Sure. <clears throat> So number 14 would be um, em per shemshe, em per ro, em ponero, et em mau. Em poneros, okay. Yeah, um, that can't be right. No, of course. And it would mean uh, do not serve that evil king. Yeah, and why do you say that evil king? The evil king which is there, the yeah. Edem Ro. This thing, the etimel, um, yeah. idiomatic, the, the the evil king which is there. Hmm. Uh, good, yeah, good job, Rasmus. Uh, so fifteen is mer nefuerete hen neisnauch. 
uh, which would be bind his feet with these chains or fetters. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a reminder, there's no kink shaming in this class. So uh, <laughs> whatever you're going to say about this. <laughs> There's no the strict no kink shaming policy unless kink shaming is your kink, in which case you've got us. I don't, I've got nothing to say. To Should I just go on? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I'm just saying stupid things. <laughs> go ahead. So it's Jitev uh, Sha Parkieros, which is uh, take him to the high priest. Yep. Uh, and then Amahte um, Moth. Sees him. Good, yeah. Things are going really badly for this dude. And now a prehentpe, uh, which is see the sun in the sky. Yeah, good. And see it as, um, as an imperative. Wait, how else could it be? See the sun in the sky. Yeah, it has to be imperative, obviously, in your translation. Um, okay, good job, Rasmus. And uh, Peter, are you ready to do this? As long as everybody doesn't get annoyed that I'm uh, so new and badly pronounced. They, they, won't, they won't get annoyed. They're not allowed to get annoyed because this was them at one point too. <laughs> okay. Uh, ma, so 19. Maute e pek, pek son pesh ere. Yeah, good. So I'll tell you one uh, little note here, this Omicron Ypsilon, whenever you see those together, you can always just pretend it's one letter. Just like oh. read, read it as, oops, I'm still in Coptic. Read it as just ooh. Ooh, okay. Yeah, and then um, it, it will sometimes be used, uh, it depends on where it is in a word and it, it will just take some getting used to to, to understand this, but um, a lot of times if it's used at the beginning of a word before a vowel, it will have kind of a W quality. For instance, here mm -hmm. in Waish, mm -hmm. This is just like a wow. the ooh becomes a w, wow. uh, but when it's between two consonants like this, and it's like the uh, it's the nucleus of the syllable, it will be ooh the vowel ooh. So mute okay. pexon shere. Okay, thank you. And uh, just tell me which words you haven't seen before, and I'll tell you what they mean. All of them. <laughs> okay, mute is uh, call in the sense of, it can mean call in the sense of name someone and call in the sense of like shout for someone uh, to get someone's attention. It does not mean call in the sense of uh, shout generally though. So like to call out is not mute, that's osh of all. Uh, so mute is call someone by name or, or like address someone. And then mute e pek son. So son means uh, brother. Uh -huh. uh, everybody gets that wrong, including, I just almost said son just now. It's very confusing because it looks like son, uh, but it means brother. So they're like so close in meaning, but slightly different. And uh, everybody makes mistakes with that for a little while. And then, okay, so, uh, and then peck son, your brother. It's literally the of you brother, I'm speaking to a man. And then shere is son, shere is son. And then there's a rule in Coptic, which says the vocative always uses the definite article. So you don't say, in Coptic, you don't say, hey, man. In Coptic, you say, hey, the man, um, which is just delightful. So it's literally the son, but it's speaking to someone. So mute epek son shere. You want to try to put that together? Um, call out to your brother, my son. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't actually say my son. This is kind of a nitpick, oh. but my son would be pa shere. Pa uh, and it's actually just sun. Um, sun, okay, okay. Yeah. And Shere would be related to the Middle Egyptian saw, right? It's not, it's related to the word Hered, um, which means child. Children, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, you'll see it in the plural a lot, Herdu, uh, but it's it's this, was it A20, wait, oh, I forgot the thing, A. Yeah, yeah. This one, wait, no, Yeah. obviously not that one. Got the two kids. That one, yeah. yeah. Uh, this one, or the one with the two with the two people for for children yeah. in the plural. Okay, cool. Uh, okay. Har e hare eron e m 
Matoy. Good. Yeah, um, Hare, we saw before, it's kind of like guard or uh, protect. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Eron, this is, this is the preposition a, eh, but the pre-pronominal form. So there's a eh before a noun, muta epexon, call to your brother. And then there's Hare Eron, which is, uh, Eron is the combined preposition and pronoun. So it's like toward us. So okay. Hare Eron, uh, guard toward us, and then eh again, toward. And then Matoy is soldier. What do you think? What do you think M Matoy is? Mm, guard all of these uh, toward my soldiers and so maybe prisoners. Uh, or am I jumping too far? I just, um, that's just M Matoy by itself, if you just saw it by itself. I'm actually checking for the M at the beginning to see if, if you can um, either, if you've seen it before, or if you can figure out why there's an M on the front of this word. Mm, um, I don't know. So I'll tell you, you might expect to see N matoy, but then there's oh, assimilation. Oh, oh. So it, yeah, so it changes because of the different consonants um, at the front of the vowel, or I'm sorry, at the front of the word, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's just something you have to kind of reverse engineer whenever you see it. Uh, if you see an M like this, you normally have to figure out what it's really supposed to be. Um, sort of underlying, like the, the underlying lexeme is the N of the definite plural definite article. So the soldiers, mm -hmm. M matoy means okay. the soldiers. So hare okay. eron, a guard to us toward the soldiers. I'll see if you can make sense of that. It, it doesn't really translate easily. Guard to us. So are the soldiers captives then? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Maybe the soldiers are being told to guard this group of people. So it could be vocative, but I think it's the other way around. I think it's, I, I don't know for sure. Somebody uh, speak up if you have a different interpretation, but I feel like it's guard us against the soldiers, like protect us oh. from the soldiers. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think so. I'm not totally 100% on that because it's a, a weird idiom that you don't see that often. Sure. Uh, but okay. let's see, there's another hare that we can, oh yeah, hare e tapsike is um, guard my psyche, pacho, pacho, uh, the, okay. the Lord, my Lord. Uh, so I think that's the same thing going on here. So hare eron is, is the same. So here we have a noun, hare e tapsike, um, guard my psyche. And then here we have a pronoun, guard us. Uh, so we get a different mm -hmm. form of the preposition, but the construction is the same. And this is a good way of illustrating that. So prepositions in Coptic always have two forms. There's the pre-nominal form and the pre-pronominal form, uh, but they really are the same thing. Uh, so you can kind of imagine, I like to pretend, if you've ever seen any of those videos that like show the inside of a cell and it's like computer animated and the little, mm -hmm. like the, the, I forget what these things are called. Uh, the like ribosome or whatever comes to the yeah, little yeah, strand yeah. of genetic material like attaches onto it. You can picture these prepositions being like that. Like there's a little e eh preposition just kind of floating around. There's like a little n pronoun that means us. And then when they stick together, it, the preposition changes and it, they merge hmm. and become a different thing when they're combined. Um, cool. So that's just a, something to get used to. I think it's really neat. Yeah, it's a really fun part of Coptic, yeah. uh, but it does take some getting used to. And you will almost certainly uh, have moments where you can't figure out what in the world preposition you're looking at because you've never seen the pre-pronominal form of it and you're, you're not able to mentally connect it to the form you have seen because they look totally different. Uh, so yeah, it's just something part of getting used to the language. Um, anyway, do you want to try 21? Sure. Um, M per show. M Pam to evil. Oh uh, yeah, mm. I think the last word is evil. Uh, it's not the last word. Evil okay. is is like out. Um, okay. Oh, but it's, it does look like the word evil. Um, <laughs> imper is like the negative imperative, so it's like do not in English. Okay. Okay. Sure. Cho means wait and then, uh, or stay, and then 
Pum to evolve, I'm just gonna kind of leave that aside for right now. That means in my presence. So imta is a is a really hard word to explain in Coptic because it just has no um, parallel in English. Kind of the closest thing I could give is uh, if you've ever seen like a movie where people are racing and like you're in like your point of view characters in this one car and the other car comes up really mm -hmm. fast and then it kind of ends up like level with you and then like maybe starts to pull away or something. That's kind of what imta is. Imta is like the equal position of where your race car is. So if something is in your imta, it's like with you in your presence. Mm -hmm. um, it's really hard concept to, it's super abstract and we just don't have a word for it in English. Uh, so basically impercha impamto evol, so is uh, something in my presence. What do you think impercha means? Um, wait in my presence? Or impercha. Right Impericho, negative. Oh, don't don't wait in my presence. Get out of my yeah. presence. Yeah, don't stay in my presence. Get out of here. <laughs> uh, it's a Coptic way of saying get lost. Um, okay. What the other students will say to me after I uh, finish reading. No, they won't say that. They <laughs> won't. They're nice students. They're nice. <laughs> okay, I will try attempt. 22. Thank you so much again. Um, no, no problem. T Naf N U K U I M M O I M O I M O. So this is Mo. It's Ma. Just the first part. M Omicron is Ma plus an U. So it's like Mo. Okay. It's kind of like I'm the sound of the Mo. English letter O, uh, but with a little more U in it. Mo. I can tell you the Fs are um, masculine pronouns, probably. Yeah, they are. <laughs> um, so Nof is different. actually this 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 phrase actually works pretty well uh, in Middle Egyptian, uh, except for it doesn't use the irregular imperative. That's the only thing that's kind of strange about it. Uh, and then there's this N that marks the direct object that you can just ignore for now. Oh, so the T is the D. Interesting. Yeah. Give to him, uh, koi, koi. Hmm. Koi means a uh, little. A little. And then I was going to ask about the M. Is the M, the M in Middle Egyptian? Um, is it the preposition M with the it owl? It can be. It can also be the preposition N because there's this weird thing where N and M kind of become uh, a single phoneme in uh, very late Egyptian leading to Coptic. Uh, so it's assimilated with the following word. In this case, it's literally this. And hey, here's oh, a, a, a yeah, much older of example of water. Yeah, yeah in yeah. Mo. Um, here's an earlier example of the same phenomenon, right? Why is Mu three N signs uh, like Nu Whereas the mm. N it, by itself, it's just N. Uh, this, this interplay between N and M was probably going on in Egyptian for a very long time. And again, mm -hmm. I don't think anybody really understands it. Quick question though, isn't that just pictorial? Like three water lines basically as an image of, of water? Um, oh, yes. whether it's a determinative or whether it actually has sound? Yeah, good question. Yeah, it can be, it's ideographic, right? Um, but so it could be, yeah. So it, it could just be totally ideographic. To me, it seems quite likely based on the, the way that Egyptians liked to do things and the way they kind of like to play with their language. I don't think they, well, they might have. They might have written it that way. Um, but I think it's quite likely that it is kind of a bit of wordplay. So they're, they're writing new, like uh, literally N plural, new, uh, for mu. I, I don't think that was lost on them. Um, Looks like water, sounds like water, basically. So it's a tool for Exactly. Yeah. Um, and they really love those um, those kind of uh, puns where you get two totally different things aligning in an unexpected way. Uh, it's kind of the heart of all humor, but uh, Egyptian the Egyptian script uses it a lot to, to affect, to create uh, little word games. Uh, okay, so Dinaf and Ukui and Mo, did you, did you translate that one completely? Uh, I'm assuming it had something about giving him a little bit of water. Yeah, give him a little water. 
And notice we're not using the, uh, the imperative form of D here. So we saw in an earlier example, ma and kanim and nevi'en, uh, give everything to the poor. Uh, we got ma, and here we have D. I think this is just Lambda's way of showing you that they would sometimes use the, the bare verb as the imperative, which is kind of difficult to imagine for me anyway. Like most of the time when a language has an irregular form, you aren't allowed to use what would be the regular form. Like you can't say um, in English, you can't say I goad, right? You have to say I went. You don't really have the option mm -hmm. of, of making it regular. Uh, but in Egyptian with this particular verb, you do have the option of making it regular, which is kind of just like, it seems to be that ma is kind of disappearing from the language and it's on its way out. Uh, okay, so Dinoff in Ukuyamo, give him a little water. Um, going back to the top, Aurelio, do you want to do five of these? Oh, thank you very much, Peter, for being brave enough to uh, to take a stab at it. Uh, like I say, it's, it's always good for us to slow down. Wait, do you have one left? Two, three, four. Five. I think I've oh, made the, you, the other students suffer enough, but uh, okay. Thank well, you. It's up to you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, okay, I'll we'll go to Aurelio. Thank you very much for doing that, Peter. Aurelio, do you want to do five of these? Sure. Okay. So, Aripai and Tache, um, do this in this in this in, in my oh in my manner. So basically, do this like me. Yeah. Um, definitely a good translation. There's other ways of translating this. Uh, okay. It could be uh, do this for a lifetime, ahe, meaning like lifetime. Oh God. Okay. All right. <laughs> or do this for the treasure. I think ahe meaning treasure is feminine. Uh, yeah. There's a bunch of different translations there, but you got it. You got it right. If you divide it here, it becomes tahe, my manner. So I went with the vocabulary on you. <laughs> okay. Ah, okay. Yeah. There we go. I mean that works. All right. And so Ari, of course, from Ire, uh, doing, yeah. uh, to do. Okay. Um, Ani met in Rome e Pema. Um, bring 10 men to this place or bring 10, yeah, bring 10 people here. Yeah. And good. that is, uh, oh, hang on, Ani, um, na Ine. Uh, couldn't think of the, the simple infinitive for a moment. Infinitive. Okay. Um, next one. In voish nim arire entefhe. Arire entefhe is do it in his manner, basically. Um, in voish yeah. nim anytime. So every time do it like this, basically. Do I have it right? Yeah, I think so. I'm not sure about arire. That's weird. Why is it? Why is it too? I don't remember this. Does somebody, can somebody, Aurelio, can you explain this? Why is it arire and not just ari? Arire. arire. Hmm, hang on, let me, let me look. Arire. No, I don't know either. This is why I should really do my homework uh, before the class time so that I can answer these kinds of questions, but I was can lazy I, and I, I did not. Can I try? Yeah, uh, go for it. Lambden, well, Lambden says that Arire is the um, sort of uh, without the uh, object, uh, is this the first uh, principal part of uh, Ire in the imperative? Oh, that's With it. Arire, okay. and then it's Ari if you, if you have the sort of object directly onto it. That's it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good call, David. So, uh, so it'd Thanks. be Ariere, mm -hmm. uh, and then I guess like this, Ari, Ari. Arit. Actually, he doesn't have a T, interesting enough. So, it doesn't have a T. That's weird. Nope. Definitely want to put a T Ari, on there. Ari, Ari. Well, Ari, Ari, I should say. It's also weird that there's two R's in here. It doesn't make any sense, does it? I mean... Well, it, in a way it does, because that's this. But we're steering into some really strange territory here. Oh, oh, it's oh. It's gemination. Gemina gem uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tertia geminata or whatever, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, but Oops. that's that's usually believed to mean that the uh, consonants are together. I know Alan, uh, my my teacher, argued that it was that it's written that way because they're separated by a vowel. Um, so it's not really gemination in like Semitic languages. It's more like um, Egyptian collapses consonants until there's a vowel between them, and then if there's a vowel, you have to write it again because there's it's like there's two of them. Um, where you you can see exactly what 
you can see the same thing happening in Coptic. Here, there's one of them. Here, there's two of them. Uh, and all that's really happened is that there's a vowel in between and sort of collapsing these two R's together because there's no vowel in between them. Um, yeah, I don't know what's up with that. That's a, actually a really interesting question. Never noticed that before. Okay, so where did where did you start? You started here. All right. I think I have two more. Yeah, a maiden a hun a pefer pe. A maiden comes from. I just looked it up again. Comes from amu. I'm sorry. Comes from from uh, e. So uh, imperative plural of uh, of to come. Yep. So come into his temple. Good. Yeah. Okay, next one is kind of this, yeah. Feminine version of the same imperative. So, ame sharoi tashere, come to me, my daughter. Yep, come to me, my daughter. Very good. Okay, thank you, Aurelio. Um, Moaz, do you want to do five more? Sure. Um, uh, I want uh, um, pro, uh, open the door. Good. Yeah, what's this alpha here? What's that about? It's it's uh, I think it's the imperative uh, that they add an alpha at the beginning. Yep, that's exactly it. So the verb is one, uh, but the, in the imperative it's awon. And there's a few examples like that where they add that alpha at the beginning to the imperative. Good job. Okay, so impertem pro, don't close the door. Good, yeah. Cho nemai en shmoon en evot, stay with me eight months or like... Uh, yeah, stay with me eight months. Yeah, you could say for eight months or eight months in English, uh, but the Coptic is identical. So en shmoon in evot. So Coptic kind of literally writes for eight months. Uh, yeah, either way is fine. Okay. Um, now, they did not understand the parables which he spoke to them. Yeah, good. It's kind of a kind of a long one. You got another long one here. Yeah. Um uh, Awamahte So the soldiers seized him mm -hmm. and they bound him and they threw him in prison. Yeah, good. Okay. Great job, Moaz. Um Give five to the next person, which is going to be Christian. Yep. Um, number three. Um, they did not understand, namely the crowd, um, that he was the Christ. Yeah. Good. I feel like these are much easier than the little shorty ones. Mm -hmm. Having context uh, helps. Not all bunched together, probably, but yeah. More context, yeah. Um, number four, Nshaje, Nshaje, Nenai, Mpti, 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 Diabolos, Mpti, Sotmo. These are the words of the devil. Don't listen to them. Yeah, good. Um, Af ime um pewoish je apefiot mu. Oh, that's sad. Um, he understood in this moment that his father died, or yeah, is dying. Had um, died. Apefiot mu. Yeah. So this is a good illustration of the fact that um, Egyptian still has this relative tense. Uh, you still have this in modern Egyptian Arabic today. Uh, so. Afroasiatic languages originally, I believe, were generally uh, marked, verbs were marked for aspect rather than tense. Uh, so something was either continuous or, uh, or perfective. And then um, it, Egyptian developed tense pretty late, probably after Middle Egyptian. Uh, de people debate that, but roughly, um, I think we can kind of agree. It developed tense somewhat late. Um, and uh, it converted things that were uh, imperfective aspect into the present tense generally, and things that were perfective aspect into the past tense. So in this case, we have um, apef yot mu uh, would be, if you saw it in a sentence by itself, it would be his father died, apef yot mu. 
um, it would just be the the preterite. Well, because it's af ime emboish je apefiot mu. So he understood in that time that, uh, so now we have relative tense here because we have a subordinate clause. So he understood in that time that his father had died, right, in the past. Uh, so we have past of the past, like a pluperfect thing going on. Uh, this, this pushes it back in time. Um, yeah, does that make sense to everyone? This relative tense thing? Um, and then number six, Nim Pentat Hare Eroten Evol Hen in Jijewe. Who is he um, who uh, protected y'all um, out from um, the enemies? Yeah. So, uh, Evol Hen is hard to translate, but um, yeah, against, from. right? From, yeah. yeah. Someone from something, you can say that in English. And it works. Um, and then enteras u au entes epe entesone. So when she conceived. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Why is this one tricky? Why is it tricky? Because it looks like it could be entere and then something afterwards, but that would have to be a noun and so looks like the verb to drink. Yeah, so exactly. It, one might be tempted to say in so like when someone drank, but that doesn't actually work here. Right. And that uh, actually is, that could be valid, right? You could write that this way in Coptic because they often collapse double consonants in writing. Uh, oh, so, so you could, could you could see in so in a text and it would mean when she drank. That's totally possible. Uh, okay. Um, okay. And, um, and then, yeah, the, oh, and just she, they brought her into the house of her sister. Yeah, good. And then um, eight. Af jok evol neho empeshimshe. So jok evol is a compound verb. It means uh, complete. He completed the days of his service. Good. Yeah, that's it. Um, okay, we're almost finished. I know we're we're going to run a little late today, but um, quite a lot of questions. So I'll go ahead and get through all of them. Who wants this? Big one of six questions. Dante, do you want, wait, hang on, <clears throat> one, two, I have three people left. Let me see how many questions, 11 questions. Uh, how about I give each of you four, roughly? Is that okay? Yep. Okay. Um, I think you skipped eight though. Oh, I skipped, I skipped so many things. Uh, no, eight is off joke of all in the whole, he finished the, the days of his service. Oh, okay. Um, so, I think uh, I have to do, yeah, we'll, we'll just do four and see how it works out. Okay. How mute eroi em pran en tamaao. So they called me the name of my mother, meaning they named me after my mother. Yep. And Good. then how mute e pran em shere che. Jesus. So they called the name of the child Jesus, meaning they named the, the, the son or child Jesus. Yeah, why is he named Jesus? Does anyone remember? It's specifically explained in the Gospels, uh, and I think it's one of the most interesting verses in all of the Gospels because it basically proves that it was translated from a Semitic original version of the text. Uh, they named him Yeshua because he would Yesha save his people. Uh, pun doesn't work in Greek, so has to come from an original Semitic text, probably Hebrew, because Yesha is actually not a, a common Aramaic verb. Uh, so it must they must have been translated from at least an oral Semitic version of the Gospels. Pretty pretty neat. Yeah. Yep. I shamshenaf and sashfe and rom. Okay, so um, I served him for seven years. Yeah, good. Ulaau pe hopnim en takaau. So um, everything that you did is nothing. 
is a yeah. nothing. Yeah, or... ulaope, a, a nothing it is. Hovnim and tak al, namely everything which you did them. Uh, this is this is a doozy of a sentence. I'm impressed that you translated it so well because uh, it's it's pretty uh, it's, it's pretty uh, I don't know the word nappy rooted. I don't know. It's all it's all twisted up together. Um, David, do you want to do? I, I have to go now. I'm sorry. I have to say okay, goodbye no, there, <laughs> Okay, that's all right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming, David. Rasmus, do you want to do these four? Sure. <clears throat> so 13 is um, Ab Diabolos and Tef e Teremos. The devil brought him to the desert. Yes. Uh, 14 is Et beu em perteneme en nasbo. Uh, why did you all not understand my instructions? Is that right? Um, yes. Uh, or yeah, my yeah, my instructions. Or yeah, why did you all not understand my instructions? Um, uh, Fifteen is ayamachte em pejome teref. Uh, I've learned all the book by heart. Yeah, exactly. I've, I've seized the whole book. Literally. Uh, yeah. And 16 is in uh, Enim, which is who did you summon? Who did you call for? Yeah. Um, it's kind of weird that like Mute, he's using Mute to mean summon because there is a word Tohim that specifically means summon. Um, but he, I think he just wanted to use this mute verb again. Uh, so who, who are you calling? Who are you calling? That's what it means. Who are you calling? <laughs> However you want to interpret that. Uh, not a great example sentence. Peter, we got three left. Do you want to do them? Sure, I just don't want to make you late for your next class too. Um, uh, we're doing uh, the, the Allen Coptic dialects next. Um, and that, that class is a little bit more freewheeling. We kind of just do as much as we do. So it's not a big deal. Don't worry about that. Uh, and okay. I'm, I'm going to, I'll break this down for you too, once you. Okay. Entate ten chen en eish en he ash en he. Yep. Um, yeah, that's what it says. Uh, so I'm going to break this apart into all of its parts. Uh, wait, I need this thing. Which I got to change my keyboard. I think it's this. Yeah. Um, there's like a null morpheme at the end of that. Um, okay. So, uh, tetin, you might recognize from earlier stages of Egyptian as the U plural form, second person mm -hmm. plural. Chent comes from uh, gamet, finding. Oh, yeah, okay. And then a teten, this whole thing is actually irten, right? It's you did, you plural did, y'all did. Hmm. Chent, uh, gamet, this is actually a really good one to like write. You did find something? Yeah. Find. What if I write it like this? Uh, me? Yeah, we'd actually really want to write it something like uh, this. It's coming. It's coming from late Egyptian, right? Uh, so it's got this like two thing on the end, uh, where it kind of they they write it again because the final t is normally not pronounced. Uh, but we can just write it like this for now. So uh, y'all found me, and then an ash and hey. Uh, this actually, I, I can we can keep going with this business of, of writing things out uh, in earlier Egyptian because this actually works really well. Okay. You all did find a thing or something like that? Yeah, he actually, uh, uh, it's, it's scooched a little bit in semantic space to mean manner rather than thing anymore. So it's like the way oh. that you do something. Interesting. Um, so y'all found me, how, in, in what manner? Oh, okay, okay. And then this part, uh, you definitely haven't seen this yet. And this is a whole thing that we don't have time to go into, but this makes it the second preterite. And the second tense is like an emphatic tense.
that is used to emphasize some part of the sentence, uh, it's roughly equivalent, in my opinion, it's roughly equivalent to the way that we use the verb do in English. So uh, you said what versus what did you say? Uh, Coptic tends to use the second tense form in questions, uh, just like we use do in questions in English. It's a, it's a grammatical thing that developed later. Um, you'll get to it in the book and we'll, we'll see many more examples of it um, before you're asked to understand what it does. Uh, okay, so good. Entag, entag, team, page, meton. Yeah, I don't know. Oh yeah, I have to tell you what, sorry, I, I got distracted. I was thinking about yeah. tea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally fine, sorry, everybody. Else. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so um, this is the same word as this. Wait, why is it chem, not chen? Oh, because because pay. So the, the final M, N has assimilated to become an M. So ak chem pei jome tone. Tone means where. Uh, you actually might recognize this from late Egyptian as tenu or chenu from middle Egyptian. It's a word that means where. Uh, and then because it's a question, you get the second preterite. So you get this marker of the second tense at the beginning. But then the rest, uh, ak chem pei jome. Jome means book. Um, it actually comes from medjot in earlier Egyptian. Oh, there's a one order. Okay. So, uh, and then chem is, is from gemi. To find. Okay. So, akchem pe jome tone. Hmm. So, jome just, again is the book? Yeah. Pe jome is this book, and akchem is you found. Okay. Okay. So, you found me, you found this book where or, or yeah. something like that? Yeah, that's exactly it. Where did you find this book? Put it all together, and you get this word salad. Um, uh, but it, it really means something. It really does. That is really interesting how they just smush it all together, and it's really, really long. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's like if like you Hawaiian were doing. Or, uh... <laughs> does Hawaiian do that? I don't know anything about Hawaiian. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I just think of really long, long words, or like Welsh, or something like that. So. Yeah. Uh, Wait. Um, oh, go go ahead. Go ahead, Peter. Wash. Wash m mine te te. Let's see. Taste vu. Taste vu. Yeah, it's actually o, but oh, it's it's also uh, it's it's uh misplaced with u a lot of times too. So it's pretty close in pronunciation. Uh, okay, so um. I don't think you've seen nominal sentences yet. So I'll just have to tell you. I think I'll just have to do this one. Uh, uasha mine is a which type. So mine means type or sort or variety. Uh, uasha mine is, is what what variety. And then uasha mine te te spo. That's hard to really explain in detail, but this is basically like the feminine copula. Uh, so what is this instruction? Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, that you're going to have to see nominal sentences because it's you can't really translate it word for word. You kind of have to just comprehend the Coptic and just make the same meaning in English because you can't like bring it across um, mm. in the in the usual way of of translation. I just realized I made kind of a Latin pun with that. Bring it across, but like normally you can take something and just kind of like literally bring it across from one language to the other. And in this case, you actually just have to figure out what it means over here and just make the same thing, right? Uasha mina te tespo. What kind of teaching is is this? What what what's mm. of what sort is this teaching? Uh, which is what students might ask after the conclusion of this class. The hell kind of teaching is this? Um, okay. And speaking of very very rapid, uh, not very well thought out teaching, uh, lesson eighteen is the first present. It's really important, and we're only going to talk about it for about ten seconds uh, because. We don't have that much time, but uh, there are a few things to see in here. I'm just going to skim and highlight all of them for you really quickly. Um, a few things to see in this chapter are the, the first present verb form, 
the negative first present, uh, which is n plus on. Uh, so you, we'll see lots of examples of that. Uh, also the first future, which is composed of the first present. And then he does this long thing about impar intransitives, which is not actually that important. Okay, so going back to the start, the first present, um, this is the, it's something called the bipartite. You've only seen tripartite verbs thus far. Uh, tripartite verbs are called the non-durative by Leighton and his grammar. Um, and that is roughly correct. Uh, tripartite verbs tend to be telic and finite, whereas bipartite verbs tend to be continuous and atelic. So, um, so dirime is I am weeping versus airime, I wept, right? And airime, I, I wept is complete. Dirime, I am weeping, can be kind of an ongoing thing. Uh, this actually comes from the um, subject pronouns. There's another word for them in, in late Egyptian. Can't think of it right now. I think Cherny uh, and Rolly uses a different name for it. I don't remember. Um, but anyway, so subject pronouns like tui, tek, uh, tech or tet, uh, and then su and si or set, and then uh, tu n, tu ten, and then I think sen. Yeah, sen, that's how we get this. So uh, if you study late Egyptian, you'll see those subject pronouns. They're, th they're the pronouns that get used for the new pseudo verbal where you have like uh, tui hair remet, I am upon weeping. Uh, that's where this comes from. Obviously, if that doesn't make any sense because you have never studied earlier stage of Egyptian, just don't worry about it. You can understand this in its own terms. Uh, basically, there's a T at the beginning in some cases, uh, namely the first person, the second person feminine, the first person plural, the second person plural. Uh, yeah, just those examples. There's a T at the beginning and then the normal suffix pronouns. So dirime, I am weeping is uh, T plus the I of the first person common singular suffix pronoun plus the verb rime. Uh, te rime, this is T plus the, um, the glottal stop of the second person feminine. Uh, it used to be a T, it turns into a glottal stop. Te rime, and then ten, the N of the first person plural, ten rime, and then teten, the ten of the second person plural. And then in the other cases, there used to be a te and it's actually dropped off over time. So it would have been something like te crime in the late New Kingdom, uh, but it's just crime in Coptic. Uh, and then frime, he is weeping, srime, she is weeping. And then serime, this is one of two remaining cases where the sen, uh, third person plural form from Middle, Middle Egyptian is preserved in Coptic. You might have noticed that you see u pretty much everywhere. Uh, this is one of two places in Coptic where it's actually preserved. The other one is in the conjunctive, uh, insa, is and they. Um, okay, so that's basically it. Oh, it, it talks about, wait, prefix of the second person. Oh, oh okay, also appears as ter, or, yeah, so it can keep the, keep an R, really add an R. Uh, that's kind of a generalization. Uh, so second person feminine can have an R in it. And then you can use the, um, the adverbial sentence with these uh, prefixes as well. So ti him pay or insa him pay on, uh, I am in the house and they are not in the house. Uh, that also shows you how negation works. And it also tells you something about how this bipartite form works etymologically. Uh, uh, ti rime is, comes from ti he rime, I am upon crying. Uh, so it at, was originally an, an adverbial sentence with a prepositional phrase as a verbal construction, but then the preposition is dropped out. And so now you just say, the rime, I crying. Um, and then the, the first future is a really important one to learn. Basically, you just stick na in there and it becomes future. Na originally meant uh, to sail or just to go. So this is like, I'm going to cry. Ti na rime and ek na rime, you are going to cry. Rome narime, the man will cry. When Rome narime, there's a man who will cry. Uh, there's a man about to cry, or what, however you translate that. Inti narime an, I will not cry. I promised myself I would not cry. Uh, and then there's some more stuff about transitives, which is not all that important because it's really easy to understand. 
uh, I closed the door versus the door closed. Um, doesn't really seem that complicated to me. And then there's some more verbs of various types, infinitives of the type cote. Um, a few more examples of that, and then some exercises. So does anyone have any questions before we go about what's going on in here? It's a very rapid fire explanation. Um, yeah, that's about all there is to it. It's just a new verb form. Uh, it's a new construction. So you have to memorize these, but you should observe that they have some commonality with other ones that you've seen before. And yeah, we'll practice it. Okay, Rasmus had to leave. Sorry we ran late, everyone. Um, yeah, that's all for today. If you want to come to uh, Coptic dialect reading, I'm going to jump in there real quick, and I hope to see some of you. And uh, if not, have a great week, and I'll see you next Saturday. See you there. See you in a moment. Thank you. Bye, everyone.